Hello and welcome to the Thursday, November 2nd, 2023 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The bad guys are never shy to try out a new file format if they figure it allows them to bypass some kind of protection mechanism. The latest example is a file format known by its extension as CPAC. And the idea behind this file format, the legitimate idea is that it's an append-only archive. So you can essentially add various versions uh, to the archive uh, and with that then also sort of roll back basically the state of the archive. But that's actually not what uh, the attacker is interested in here. They're really just uh, looking into bypassing the standard detection mechanisms by using a file format that's not quite that common. Well, uh, easy enough, I think, uh, to block the .cpaq extension in whatever mail filters, uh, web filters and such you have. Haven't really seen this uh, being used legitimately. The file that Xavier is describing here is also very large once it is unpacked, which of course then also as discussed earlier this week, does sometimes help in bypassing security controls. And as a reminder, as of today, CVSS version 4.0 is official. Pretty sure we'll see 3.1 and such around for a while longer. Just as people switch over to 4.0, a couple advantages of 4.0 is sort of some cleanup in the language, but also, for example, better distinguishing between a passive active user interaction and a couple things that should make the CVSS score more telling. Of course, there is still a lot of sort of flexibility as we have seen in the past in how these particular categories are then going to be applied. It looks like someone pulled the plug on the Mosey botnet. Now, we have in the past, of course, seen law enforcement do similar things. This does not appear to be a publicly announced law enforcement action. Could be the Mosey botnet operator themselves. Mosey has been famous the last few years for infecting IoT devices. It's sort of along the same lines of like Mirai and such, where it basically just uh, breaks into a device with weak passwords and also looking for a couple of uh, web uh, vulnerabilities uh, typically. Now, this kill switch may not be permanent. Just read the write-up that ESET has about this kill switch. It does, for example, do things like, of course, delete uh, the bot itself from the system. It does disable the SSH daemon. It's not clear if this will actually then survive a reboot of the system. We have seen this sometimes in the past where people sort of talked about some destructive payloads in these IoT bots, but quite frequently the actual sort of partition with the firmware is not writable. So after a reboot, these systems will often recover in sort of a default and vulnerable condition. So it's Probably just a matter of time then for the systems to get reinfected with something else. Of course, uh, we have seen particular bots uh, like Mosey proliferate uh, very quickly and there are dozens of them uh, around simultaneously. And Infoblox noted the registration of a large number of short.us domains that are then apparently being used as a URL shortener in order to redirect victims to malicious sites. URL shorteners are nothing new and I think a competent information security program should be able to deal with that threat in the end while the user first clicks on the shortened link, the user will then just be redirected to the malicious site. So really there's no big difference to the user just directly going to the malicious site. What usually sort of really is the difference here that due to the URL shortening, you may be more likely to actually click on the malicious link, but the effect in the end is the same. 
And there's a lot of talk lately, of course, about HAR files. These are these browser archives that are often used for debugging and were used against Okta customers after some of these debug files were stolen from Okta. Along these lines, there's a nice blog post by Falcon Spy about how to use these HAR files, in particular when it comes to impersonating Slack users, essentially by using these HAR files and extracting information from it that then allows you to basically steal session IDs for Slack. Interesting blog post, and of course, can easily be applied to other applications as well. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.